Next up is Peter Neubauer. He's going to talk about Plato. Wait, that's me. Uh, first question is, what is Plato? Plato is an acronym that stands for Program Logic for Auto Automatic Teaching Operations. I'm going to give a little bit of background on what is Plato, what's the history of Plato, why is it interesting, and then I'll dive into the Apple II aspect. So I'll start off away from the Apple II back in the 1950s, actually, and then veer back to the Apple II and finish up with a couple of demonstrations. <coughs> back in the mid-1950s, computers were, computers were a lot different than we're used to today. Every computer was hand-built, usually by a large institution. The, the whole idea of a personal computer w was unheard of. That's not where the technology was. Um, e every computer was a bit different. There, there was no idea of an off-the-shelf computer. Computing was not interactive in the sense that we have today. The, the idea of sitting down in front of a computer and typing something and getting back a response was, was cutting-edge research. Today we take it for granted, but mid-1950s, the state of the art was batch processing. Typically punch cards, sometimes magnetic tape or, or paper tape. By the end of the, end of the 1950s, a research laboratory at the University of Illinois wa was looking to refocus their, their research work. Previously, they'd done research work for uh, the def defense industry, and now they're looking to reshape themselves away from that. And they're looking for crazy new ideas. What could they do that, that would be new? And they had the idea of using computers in education. You really need to step back and understand how crazy this idea is. They're talking about taking these arcane machines in research institutions manned by graduate and PhD level electrical engineers and physicists and then put children in front of it and expect them to learn something. Now the whole idea of using machines in education was not new, but the idea of using computers in education was was crazy at the time, and most of the people with at the University of Illinois did not believe it could be done. But nonetheless, a small group at the Control Systems Laboratory began development of such a system in 1960. And then, I believe it was by late 1960, they had their first demonstration. You see a newspaper clipping, actually it's dated 1961. Um, over on the left-hand side is Don Bitzer. He was the project lead, the technical lead at the University of Illinois. Uh, so for this demo, they wanted, to, they wanted to show off the system that they had just built, the computer-based education system, at a conference that was nearby. But nearby is still too far when you're dealing with a mainframe that takes up an entire room. Uh, so what they did is used a telephone line for, for text going back from what they called a key set what we'd call a keyboard these days, though their key set was simplified with fewer keys, that would go all the way back over to the university computing facility. And for the video feed, they actually rented time with a local television studio. So video coming out of the computer, went to the local television studio, broadcast it, and this television received it. Bit jury rigged, but it shows the innovative spirit that that this team had, that this team needed to have to, to push up against the bounds of what the technology could do. And they also show that it could work the computer-based education research lab. From there, Plato grew tremendously. It saw use around the world at multiple institutions. Development continued, development and use of the system continued until the uh, mid-2000s. Over its lifespan, over 10,000 hours of original lesson material was developed. It spanned a huge variety of subjects. Uh, certainly the initial Plato system started off teaching people how to use computers. But from there it expanded to electrical engineering, occult sciences, uh, acid-based titration, English language grammar, neonatal assessment, and Esperanto. And the list is many, many pages long and you can log into the system and see that later. I just picked these because they just aren't things that you would normally think of as part of computer-based education. Between 1978 and 1985, the system, the Plato system saw over 10 million hours of use. And it was used well outside that time range, but the records are, are less complete. So 
consider 10 million to be the, the lower bound. The work that was done on Plato inspired work that we still use today. The many people who use Plato went on to, to work in the personal computer industry. Mark, our keynote speaker, mentioned that he worked at the University of Illinois, used Plato systems, mostly play games. Yes, it was a computer-based education system, but everyone has games on a computer, especially in a classroom. Some examples, uh, Silvus Werner, Castle Wolfenstein creator, uh, was, a, was a Plato user. Some major titles like uh, Macromedia Authorware, Lotus Note, and Microsoft Flight Simulator also drew inspiration from the work uh, done as part of Plato. This is an example, this is a diagram showing the architecture of Plato around 1962. First thing you'll see, there's one computer. This is a very early example of time sharing. Uh, there, are, there are records suggesting that the folks at University of Illinois invented time sharing before MIT did, although MIT is commonly, commonly credited with inventing time sharing. And it, they were really pushing the bounds of graphics technology at the time. So they had a jury rig system where the computer would select a slide, like a, a, a projector slide. They had various uh, systems for finding the right slide and projecting it. Then a video camera would take the image from that slide, transfer it to a Raytheon storage CRT. That's what the storage device is. Keep in mind, video memory was, I think, multiple dollars per bit. I don't have that in my notes, but video memory was prohibitively expensive. So they needed to use a, a storage tube to store their graphics. And then the computer would overlay text on top of that image that had been transferred there from the video camera, from the slide that the computer had selected. And then the image from the storage tube would get transferred to a TV display in front of the operator. And then keyset is a keyboard. As I said, the uh, initial Plato systems used a, a very simple, a very simplified keyboard, though later Plato systems had uh, full-size keyboard with more keys than we have on the Apple II. This is a photograph of a Plato terminal, I believe a circa 19, don't have the date, I think it's a, a version of the terminal from the mid-1970s. Later on, the Plato work drove graphics display, graphics technology development. Most notably, the gas plasma display uh, which you see right here, the same gla gas plasma display that, that's used in television, te television technology today. They were looking for something that could provide fast, flicker-free, fade-free graphics that didn't require them to buy lots of video memory. The, d the uh, plasma display is persistent. Plato eventually standardized on a 512 by 512 monochrome display, though later versions uh, did add color capabilities. There's a touch screen here as well. Uh, some later versions of the Plato terminal added sound, as well as client-side programming, a microprocessor in the terminal itself that would allow the mainframe to d uh, download code to the, uh, the local user. Now keep in mind this is a distributed network system, globally. So individual users would sit in front of this terminal, but this is not the computer. The computer is a, a supercomputer uh, living off in a computer room. There were a lot of other software innovations that Plato pioneered, innovations that we take for granted today. I already mentioned time sharing. Plato is one of the earliest examples of multiple people interacting with a single computer. Second is what they called real-time data processing. And this is real-time data processing as opposed to batch processing. That's why I mentioned earlier the whole idea of sitting down in front of a computer, interacting with the computer, and in real time, getting your response. Plato also innovated uh, an application that they called Notes, which is very similar to email today, online message forums, chat, instant messaging, emoticons. The Plato terminals had uh, software downloadable fonts, so you'll see, see a lot of interesting characters uh, show up in, in the Plato software. Uh, graphics was, was very important to many of the Plato lessons. There is also a set of uh, lesson authoring tools built into Plato. Uh, a simplified programming language tailored to scripting sequences of lessons and uh, 
and what I'll, what I'll call adaptive training or intelligent tutoring to give, the, to give the operator, the student, feedback as they're progressing through lessons. There is grade book and course management tools, context-sensitive help. That's something that I, I think took several more decades to see mainstream, but if you're looking at many of these Plato lessons from the mid-70s mid and you make a mistake, the system is intelligent enough to recommend what you did wrong. So Plato is in operation until 2015. I misspoke earlier when I said uh, mid-2000s. And the system was called Novanet. It was uh, focused on remedial and special needs education. Uh, Novanet has since shut down. However, there is a hobbyist community called Cyber One. They, they were able to recover some of the old software, and they have a Plato server available online. There's also a, another Plato server called Arata Online. I'll talk about that in a moment. Arata Online is focused on retro computing enthusiasts. Um, most, of the, most of the historic Plato users use Cyber One. That's where most of the activity is. So a few years ago, a fellow by the name of Thomas Cherry Holmes had the idea of using this Plato technology to create a retro computer enthusiast community. So taking really old technology, 1970s technology, to build a community for 1980s computer technology. On, on, on one hand, it's kind of a crazy idea, but that's also what makes it appealing. All of us like to use retro computers. Why not use even more retro computers? Plus, there's the advantage that Plato is accessible from, from retro computing platforms. If you want to take, say, Facebook or Twitter, you better have a fairly modern laptop, fast internet connection, but it's possible to write Plato terminal programs for most of, uh, most of the 1980s retro computers. And that's what uh, Mr. Cherry Holmes did. This is a sample of some of the computers that have clients with terminal programs that are capable of connecting to, to Plato. So this list is not complete. You'll want to go to their Rata Online website. There you can download disk images for a huge variety of platforms. Everything is open source. You can go over to GitHub, get the source code. There's additional clients that are in development. I think just a few weeks ago, there was a release of an alpha release of an Apple IIGS native version. Um, the 8-bit Apple II version has been out for, I think, about a year in release status. Right now, there's about 700 users registered on the Errata Online server. Uh, so you can use your Apple II to connect to Errata Online or Cyber One and get more or less the same experience as any other retro computer or your modern Mac or your modern Windows machine. So I think there's a lot of potential to create a community that is much more accessible than, than some of the other social media communities. Having said that, it is a tough sell to get enough critical mass and content on a, what's hoping to be a new social media platform targeted at rich computing enthusiasts. So let's demo this. But First, a little bit of background. I'll try to go through this quick. There's a bunch of details on the slides I will not talk about that are relevant to getting connected. Um, these will be posted later. You can refer back to them. So the general idea is you need a Plato terminal emulator, a piece of software that knows how to talk to the, the Plato server, connects over the internet to either one of two Plato servers, either Cyber One or, or the Irata online server. You can obviously do this on your modern on your modern machine, but we don't care about that. You can do that on your 8-bit Apple II machine. You will need an Apple II with 48 kilobytes or more. You'll need a super serial card in slot two. It only works on slot two. You'll need to set a couple of dip switches that are not documented right now on the Aretta Online website, but are listed right there. And then you'll need some way to connect your machine to the internet, uh, a modem emulator that connects to the serial port on your 8-bit Apple II. And from the perspective of the Apple II, looks like a modem, but on the other side, actually does a Telnet or TCP connection to a remote server. A popular example is the Wii Modem 232. You can also, you can also build your own using a Raspberry Pi and so open source software. However you do it, you have your Apple II connected via serial cable to a modem emulator to the internet. 
I also recommend a monochrome monitor. The, all the text is relatively small and done either on double high res or high res uh, pages, and it can be pretty difficult to read some, some of the text. Keep in mind that the Apple Color Composite Monitors do have a button that can switch over to black and white mode. VidHD also has a mode that allows you to uh, show double high res in black and white, and high res in black and white. If you have a newer enhanced Apple IIe, there is another version. It's n last I checked, the disk image is not posted out there, but the double high res version works very well. The added detail does, the added number of pixels does slow the screen refresh down a bit, but I think it's worth it for the for for, for the added uh, detail and resolution. And one someone at KFS, where is Michael? He added the double high res support. Thank you. That, that's really what the the Plato term project at least for the Apple II needs right now. People picking up the software and improving it. The software works well now, but I think there's a few rough edges that uh, someone who loves the Apple II can, can polish up to make this a bit more turnkey. You can use the 8-bit version on the Apple II GS, but it does not support the built-in Apple II GS serial port, so you can correctly on the Apple IIc and IIc+. Having said that, my experience is that with my Wii Modem 232 set to 1200 baud on an Apple on a stock Apple IIc, it works reliably. If I go much over 1200 baud, then it can get a little bit glitchy. I, I, I haven't checked this, but I assume it's a flow control issue there. The IIc Plus can run a bit faster just because it's an accelerated machine. I typically run 2400 baud on the IIc Plus. I think 9600 baud is pretty reliable as well. You can also run Plato Term in an emulator. Easiest way to do that is with the MicroMate emulator. It's built right in. You can also do it with Apple Win. You do need to jump through a few hoops to set up that modem emulation piece in, in Apple Win. I can help you with that if you want it. Um, it's a few tips right here. Um, it should work with other emulators. I have not tried it. I know that like GS Plus and GS Port emulate serial ports, so in theory it should work, but I'm not 100% sure. And then finally, once you booted the software, you have all the pieces connected, you'll need to issue a command to your, your modem emulator to connect off to their Rata online website. This is the typical command. Most of the modem, modem emulators support a Hayes AT style command set. So I think I have one more slide, then we'll actually show you that. Um, time permits, I'll also show you the 2GS native version. 2GS native version connects via uh, Marinetti over Ethernet. Any Marinetti supported uh, Ethernet card will work with the 2GS version. The 8-bit Apple II version, when you start it up, it has a nice option that says Ethernet in there, it, but it doesn't work. You have, to use super, you have to use the super serial version. And there's some folks working on Ethernet support, but they're just running out of memory on a 8-bit Apple II. Last thing to be aware of is the key map. This is a Play-Doh keyboard. There's a lot of extra keys over here. So you'll want to go to their Red Online website, take a look at the release notes, and there will be a key map showing you the key that is displayed in the software as well as on the keyboard and how to type that on, on your Apple II. Typically, it's a control key. Mapping is not too hard, but it does take, a, it does take a little bit to get used to. All right, now let's really do a demo. Uh, let's start with the 2C. So I've right, right now, I have a stock Apple IIc. I have a Wii Modem 232 connected to the printer port on, sorry, not the printer port, the modem port on my 2C. That's the one that maps into slot 2 on the 2C. And the Wii Modem is paired to my phone because I don't trust the Rockers network. I've also got a floppy emu over here. Could just as easily do it off of uh, a 5 and a quarter inch floppy. Right now I'm running the double high res version, so let's see if this works. ATDT, I read a online. Typed it correctly. Takes a few moments. <coughs> and we're in. 
In a moment, we'll get a login screen. All right, let's log in as guest. You can also sign up for an account. Turnaround on the account creation is usually pretty quick. There's links on their ad online website. The Cyber One account creation is a little more involved, but they turn that around in a few days for me as well. The next key that it mentions there maps over to the return key on your Apple II. Main menu. And it's it, every time you refresh the screen, it just shows a different retro computer logo. There is an Apple logo in there. Too bad we got a Tandy, but what, what can we do? Uh, games or lessons? What, what kind of mood are we in right now? Games. games. Okay, let's do games. Let's see. This is at 1200 baud, by the way. But it is full double high res graphics. I'm going to pick Battleship because I know how to play that one. There are certainly more sophisticated games. And someone on the live stream, probably Tom, has just sent us a message down here. Except it says 2018, so we'll just imagine we're in 2018. All right, let's do D for Battleship. And the data key maps to control D. So it's called Sea Battle, but just like Battleship, except not trademarked. Uh, let's go hit return. Yeah, uh, Michael mentioned that it's downloading the character set uh, that it'll use for what looks like graphics in just a moment. Okay, um, we know how to play. Sure, so hit return. Let's do a short game. Probably won't even finish that. There are some excellent multiplayer games. They're more involved to learn how to play, but there's excellent help uh, online. Um, there's also uh, original detail lessons about how player works, keys, concepts. So buried be behind all these seemingly simple menus, there's, there's a lot of content. I don't know how many lessons are in there, but probably on the order of several thousand. Oh. Okay, we're going to play against the computer. <coughs> and let's go ahead and pick one. Don't worry, I won't play this whole game. And sure, we'll go with this suggestion. That sounds good. And another ship, sure. Now oh, let's do, I don't know, 3-3. Three, three. All right, um, it's probably getting pretty boring if you're not playing. So let's go start up Micromate and Sweet 16. And as time permits, we can dig into some more of the lessons. Uh, Micromate, uh, disk catalog, press B. Then under micropacks, comms, and the one with the DHGR suffix is the double high res version. Let's do that. So Micromate's already taken care of setting or display to monochrome mode, and it also has a mod that causes it that uh, triggers it to auto connect to the Arata online server, so we don't have to type anything. There we go. Works the same as on the 2C. So let's j 
jump over to Suite 16. This is still an alpha version, but you can download the disk image right now. Obviously, uh, obviously color. <coughs> and it's connecting over Marinetti right now. little annoying to have two emulators open, so let, ah, I guess I can't do full screen. There we go. Maybe? Ah, I put it over here on the other screen. Sorry about that. Let's get out of full screen. So, just leave it the way it is. I'll log in as guest, and this time, since we had so much fun watching you play Battleship, we're going to try one of the lessons. Color looks pretty good, nice and fast, compared to the, the 8-bit version. Of course, this is this emulator, I think, right now is running at 40 megahertz, so. And, sure, this looks like a good lesson. And, sorry, it's hard for me to read the screen over there. Okay, so the LAB key, which maps to control L. And this is a, a serious college of a lesson. So it, it talks us through the uh, Kirchhoff's current and voltage laws. This is a bit of a tutorial. And then it takes us to some interactive lessons. It gives us a uh, network of current and voltage sources, asks us to solve for skip the directions, ask us to solve for the unknowns that it's about to list. What is the voltage across node I1? So that's the top left. You can type numeric values or you can type expressions. And if you type expressions, it'll try to troubleshoot what you did wrong. It'll tell you if you got a sign wrong or picked up a wrong, a wrong value. But I'll let, I'll let people solve this later. Questions for me. Questions? Yes? I have not done that, but uh, there is a language called Tutor that is built into the Plato system, and um, once you get a login to the system, you'll have access to the Tutor system and create your own content. The documentation is out there, it's just extensive and I haven't tried it yet. Yes? There is a giant lookup table in the code that is uh, doing uh, scaling. And yes, there are some, there's some software in Plato where the scaling isn't good enough, that you have a one line feature that, that doesn't show up when you scale, and it's the best we can do on the Apple II thing, I think. Quick yes? Custom design fonts for the Apple II. There's uh, several character sets, different four character sets. One of them is the regular alphabet sets, but that is in the terminal. One of them is raw, for example, in the sub but might not be able to play the terminal. But uh, and then, there, then there's a character set for the downloadable character set. That's like for games or whatever. So that, those are just hard game controls for the graphics controls. So for the benefit of the recording and the stream, Michael mentioned that there is eight, a set of 8 by 6 fonts. I think he said, you said 4 fonts? Four there are 4 character sets in ROM on the original terminals. So the, the Plato term software for the Apple II has custom, a custom designed version of those fonts that looks decent at, uh, at these resolutions. But uh, fonts that are uploaded from, from the server over to the, the client Scaling sometimes looks great, sometimes it uh, doesn't look so great because it, it misses features in the 
in the fonts as they scales them. If you want to learn more, I recommend you try it. It's free, it's easy, I can help you set it up this week. Micromate takes no effort to, to run. Hardware takes a little bit more effort, but it's not too bad once you understand the pieces that are going on. Get on there, try the content, look through those menus. There's really a lot of content be behind um, the initial r menu. The, the initial menu is designed to be easy. Downside is you can th think the whole system is simplistic, but it's not. Um, there's lessons on how to use Play-Doh, there's, there's academic content, <coughs> there's, there's fairly sophisticated games. Take a look at the Reddit online website. There's good information there. Download links. If you're interested in the history piece, there's a book out there uh, titled Friendly Orange Glow. That's a reference to the orange plasma, gas plasma displays. And you can also read an article I wrote in the latest issue of JuiceGS. Any other questions before I step off? Thank you. Hello. Oh, nice. Uh, this has a lower resolution than I anticipated, <laughs> so we'll, we'll see. Anyway. Am I introducing myself? Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, I am Paul Hagstrom. I am presenting today on Beneath, Beneath Apple Manor. Uh, okay. There we are. Uh, okay, so this sort of starts out with a Facebook post. Uh, this is Don Worth on the Apple II Enthusiasts group. Uh, he had been kind of like going through his stuff and kind of, you know, sort of distributing things around. Uh, and he says, March 13th, 2013, uh, I think this may be the last of the purge, so I'll quiet down. I have a few file folders and a eclectic mix of stuff from Beneath Apple Manor, Beneath Apple DOS and what I had called Outdoor Beneath Apple Manor, which never came to fruition because I overdesigned it. Uh, there are cartoons from Beneath Apple DOS, some that he thinks were never used, source listings, notes on things. Sounds great, right? Here's the, the picture that he included. Um, this is slightly bigger of the picture that he included. So you can see the cartoon from the book, and there's printouts and uh, quality software catalog paste up manual. Uh, it's all very cool. Um, so here we have, you know, this when you zoom in on the photo, you get the comments. Uh, and here I am. I could certainly scan it, I say. Uh, and uh, eventually, well, here, zoom in a little bit. Uh, okay, your pile's up to 12 pounds. It's in a nice big box. Great. I'll start warming up the scanner. Six years ago. <laughs> Um, so, right. Uh, he sent it relatively quickly. Here's the pile of stuff arriving in my office, uh, April 2013. And there it is again. So the folders of stuff is pretty cool. Uh, all right, so here we're, here's where we are. Um, the ideal here was that I would say, because I wasn't getting to it, you know, the years are going by. So I said, all right, well, I will, I will submit a presentation for Kansas Fest. That will be the motivation to get it done. Um, and the reality is I got close-ish. Uh, um, so it, anyone I've talked to this time has, has heard me say, oh, I'm gonna, I have to run back and go like, continue working on this thing. Um, what I've been doing for know, much of the past couple weeks, basically, um, is going through scans and sort of fixing up the colors and contrasts and 
cropping and OCRing and trying to get all this stuff uh, sort of put together. And I think I'm just about done. Uh, what I had hoped to do was to do all that first and then mine it. And so I could say, like, look at all these interesting things. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm actually going to wind up doing is presenting these things that you can do some mining on yourself. And maybe next year I will present the part two on whatever I mined. But there's, there's actually kind of a lot of stuff here. Um, so he has, he, uh, so Donworth himself is a, I think he's a mathematician at UCLA. Um, and the, so he did a, a fair amount of stuff working with fractals and topography and stuff like this. And some, there's some code in the notes about that. And uh, some interesting photos and stuff that I will show you. And I think, oh, well, actually, maybe, maybe let me back up a second. Who has played Beneath Apple Manor? Is this something that people know? Okay, th th this is that's kind of what I was suspecting because I um I have not played it. I have a kind of an idea about what it is. Um, so that was one of the other things I was gonna do, you know, before I got here was to, to sort of play it and understand it. Um, but it was it's very early. It's like 1979, uh, maybe 1978. It's a very early game. Uh, people call it roguelike, although rogue is later. But um, so it's it's a sort of it's a role-playing type game where you're, you can sort of, you go around a world and you see, uh, you, you, actually it's a procedurally generated world, so it's not the same every time, which is, that's what made me uh, think of it, you know, the fractal generation of uh, landscapes and so forth. Um, anyway, right, so, so he was interested in that, sort of like generating, generating sort of realistic uh, scenarios. There's notes on the development of Beneath Apple Manor, uh, there's actually some also some notes on some further things. So uh, there's, there was a special edition that where graphics was added. And there's also some letters that he got about the book Beneath Apple DOS and Beneath Apple ProDOS. And some notes on advertising and like sort of how, how that was done. So it, it's actually, he saved a lot of interesting stuff. It's not complete uh, in any domain, but it's interesting. Uh, I know Donworth mostly through you know, as a result of his co-writing Beneath Apple DOS. So that is uh, a fantastic book on the workings of the disk operating system. 3.3 mainly, although a little bit about 3.2. Uh, and then there was a follow-up on ProDOS, which I didn't read because I don't, I don't do ProDOS. But uh, okay, so anyway, m mainly what we have here is stuff for future research. Um, there's a there's a bunch of letters. Let's see if, I don't know if I can, I think I can make this better. Uh, he didn't send me this one though. Um, he kept this one. So this, this is a, you know, from Waz to him saying something. I would urge immediate dispensing of a Rev E Apple II to quality software, Donworth. <laughs> so a uh, little hard to read, but uh, anyway. So that was cool. He, otherwise, he sent me a bunch of this stuff. Okay, and that's the end of the presentation. So now comes the uh, the sort of random stuff. Uh, oh yeah, here maybe I can zoom out on this a little bit more. Uh, okay, there's a way to do this. Let's try that. Okay. What I want is full screen that I can zoom. There we go. Okay, maybe this is more readable. So, much of the vital third-party software is due to the available information on specifics of our hardware and operating system. So, Waz is very, you know, go open information. Um, and that's pretty cool that he was impressed uh, by this book. Okay. Um, so, what I'm planning on doing here is just sort of showing you a few of the things, some of the documents that are there, so you can sort of see what kinds of stuff there are. Um, partly due to how far I got and partly due to the very small pipe we have to the internet here. Uh, this doesn't actually exist anywhere yet, um, but it will soon, maybe by the time we're we leave uh, Kansas City, but it, at least soon there's going to be a spot on the inter internet archive with all the scanned stuff here. But, uh, so, let's see, this is the cover of the manual uh, beneath Apple Manor. Uh, and so it, this, this is sort of 
I, I think we had a, I had, he gave me a couple of copies of this actually, but, uh, but there's a lot of this like sort of legal pads with code written on them. And I thought this was actually kind of interesting too, that, that a lot of what he was, there's, there's an, uh, kind of an amazing amount of code handwritten. Uh, I mean, pages and pages and pages of this. Uh, so this this one I think is the the open routine, you know. And there's things about monsters and there's things about movement and uh, they're they're often all on these sort of independent notes, which I guess he you know by hand took and worked out. So that's interesting. This would I think be even more interesting for those who say, oh, I recognize that part of the game when it does this but because I don't know the game very well, I, w I wasn't able to do that. Uh, I think, though, that, yeah. I would never write out a program like Well, I, yeah, I didn't. Yeah. So the, um, the the discussion here was about uh, why you know did I ask Don Worth why he wrote it out on paper rather than typing it in, and uh, uh, Steve says well of course this was because it's actually uh, quite unpleasant <laughs> to type in 40 columns. This is 1978, 1979. You know, so there's there's really it's a pretty basic machine. But this actually characterizes. Uh, a lot of how do you do this? There's a show all. There's a show all tabs. Yeah. Um, this kind of this actually kind of characterizes a lot of the stuff he's got. So he's he's written out all. You know, we've seen a lot of these kinds of little, you know, graph paper pixels worked out. But in fact, actually, he's written out like the manuals. Uh, I guess that's not a good example. But but like there's there's actually uh, the I think the entire let me see mm. yeah yeah that's not it anyway he's got longhand he's got longhand versions of uh, let me actually find this so I know that the beneath Apple Manor manual uh, is written out all in longhand on these notebook papers. And then there's actually also this, I don't know if the scan's going to come out very well, but um, it's an actual paste up that was done, you know, with like strips of paper glued down that was used to make the actual manual, that the cover of which we just saw. Um, so th that's kind of cool. This is very hard to keep together. <laughs> it keeps falling apart. But... Um, this is another thing that was sort of interesting in there. So I'm, I'm, you know, basically talking about random things. If anyone wants to ask something along the way, um, when am I supposed to stop? By the way. Oh. Oh, okay. I got lots of time. I, I'm not going to need it all the time, probably. But um, uh, he he gave a class on advanced assembler uh, which actually involved like some of this some of this um, creation of uh, like large scale games and stuff like that so so it's this there's an ad here for the the class he taught I don't know what 1981 I guess uh, and a course outline for sort of like what he did in order to teach people assembly language 10 week class no, two 10 week classes um, the thing that reminded me of it was actually the, um, where was it, this. I think this was actually a talk he gave at a user group, um, sort of about what one does to design large-scale games. And it's, it's interesting to sort of see, you know, from the perspective of this very early time in computer history, you know, like what, what um, considerations there were. So, uh, like... What makes a what it, what kind of game is good for this kind of computerization? So board games work well. Uh, uh, well, no, some board games work well. SSI did some, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work well on a computer. Uh, 
<laughs> anyway, whatever. You can read this on your own, but it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing that he kept. So, uh, okay. There's some <laughs> letters from Blythe. So this is, uh, this is in the sort of advertising section where uh, they, they have submitted an ad to Byte Magazine and 